We are live. And ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I am so, so, so excited that today I have Dr. Vananda Shiva with us on our podcast. As you know, the objective of this podcast is to elevate the environmental, ecological, and sustainable discourse in Lithuania. I'm currently helping the Green Party here become a feasible political um, alternative. And for that, we need very good ideas. We need ideas which will actually help us uh, solve some of the biggest challenges we have at the moment. And, and for me, what gives me eco-anxiety is the fact that we are messing up the earth. We are going to leave our children. And uh, if you don't know Dr. Uh, Shiva, she is a, a food sovereignty act, uh, advocate. She's an equitable, um, she's, a, she's an advocate of equitable uh, farming. She's an author. She's an environmental warrior with a focus on agriculture and biodiversity. So I think that there's nobody else or hardly anybody else in the world who can speak to us about our relationship with Mother Earth and how she feeds us as she can. Dr. Shiva, welcome onto the show. Thank you, thank you, Jacob, yeah. Let's begin with the first question. Uh, people say we are what we eat, is that right? And yes. Of course, and agriculture is one of the biggest issues we have uh, with the way we're living in the world today. Can you give us kind of like a, a resume, a broad um, analysis of what is happening and what is wrong with our relationship yeah. to our Mother Earth? So I come from an agrarian society. I come where, according to some records, we have found for 40,000 years and others for 10 centuries. And we did not destroy the earth. Our farms had more trees than the forests. And the soil was richer where people farmed because agriculture is care for the earth. Mm -hmm. Farming is your love for the earth. And in the tribal areas, when I travel and a person is rushing off in the middle of a meeting, we are trying to stop a bauxite mine. And I said, what happened? Where are you going? He says, I have to go beautify the earth. He doesn't say I've got to go and do duck work. Mm -hmm. uh, Australian Aboriginals were farmers of 60 centuries. We call them Bushmen, but they were farmers. Mm -hmm. Where did agriculture go wrong? It went wrong when European history went wrong. Mm -hmm. It went wrong when Hitler deployed his industry as IG Farben to mm -hmm. find ways to gas people in the concentration camps, mm -hmm. to make war chemicals. Mm -hmm. And the two um, agrochemicals agri basically that come from Hitler's labs and IG Farben mm -hmm. are asynthetic fertilizers, nitrogen fertilizers, whose origins were to make explosives and ammunition. But the mm -hmm. same process makes nitrogen fertilizer, which is why recently in Beirut, a ammonium nitrate warehouse blew up. And every uh, bomb these days is a nitrogen bomb. It's a nitrogen fertilizer bomb. And you could look at it in Oslo, you could look at it in Afghanistan, you could look at it in Oklahoma, just see the record of fertilizer bombs. So that's the first. The second is pesticides. They were originally designed to kill people, Zylon B. And then when the wars got over, they realized because they had done experiments with insects that insects died mm -hmm. in order for them to find out will the human beings die whom they've declared inferior and unfit for living. And then they said, oh, we should change agriculture. Instead of folding up the fertilizer factories, instead of folding up the toxic factories, the poison cartel, as I call it, mutated into the agrochemical industry. Then they changed agriculture. But when you grow crops together, you don't need external inputs. But when you need to have external inputs, all of agriculture would change. And I am basically trained in physics. I am not born to be an activist. I've become an activist as I've seen the wounds of Mother Earth 50 years ago with the forests of my region in the Himalaya. Mm -hmm. But it's non-separation. I did my PhD on the foundations of quantum theory. Non-separation is the knowledge of quantum theory. Mm -hmm. Non-separation is our relationship with the earth. Separation, violence, superiority, extermination is the logic of Hitler's concentration camp. So we have to reclaim agriculture from the Nazi tradition and give it back to the earth tradition that 
cultures have held for thousands of years. You know, that, that, that's such an interesting uh, um, kind of, it, it's, I mean, there's history in it, but for me, it's also kind of, it has this kind of like a metaphor in it. When you think about um, the desire of, of, of powerful people to put things at their service. Uh, I remember um, having an experience in the mountains of Colombia where I was speaking to some indigenous people there and, and they, they very much preach what you were talking about is about um, having different plants, having the forest be your farm uh, where you have plants next to each other that provide both uh, protection and some kind of... Um, uh, what do you call it? Like kind of like a mu biological mutualism uh, and they nourish each other. And one of the things that I was amazed to hear is that their yields are actually higher than in monocrop, in, in monocrop farming, something which I find unbelievable. Is that true? Oh, it's totally true. So, you know, I've grown up in the Himalaya where the terrorists are tiny. Mm -hmm. Land holdings are small. You can't even drive a tractor on those hills. You have to have bulls. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet the fields are just full and lush like the Andean mountains. Uh, and we have systems of nine crops. The movement I started is called uh, Navdanya. We have mm -hmm. systems of 12 crops. And all my research now has shown that the higher the diversity, the more it produces. Why did I end up looking at agriculture? It was in my field, but in 1984, the place where I had done my MSc honors in particle physics mm -hmm. in 1973, a decade later erupted in violence. And it was really beginning with farmers' movements who were saying, we are slaves. We can't choose what we'll grow. We can't choose how we'll grow it. We can't decide the price. And we're being forced to grow rice and wheat with chemicals. We are slaves. So I was working then for the United Nations University in Tokyo uh, for a program uh, they were running. And I said, I want to look at the conflicts in this situation. I want to look at the roots of this conflict. And that's how I did my book, The Violence of the Green Revolution. And um, I realized then that just like so much is trickery in the world, you know, they measure GDP and say, oh, economy is growing. But what is the economy that's growing? The extractive economy, where corporations take from society. Mm -hmm. It also is a war measure. When... For the war, they wanted bigger um, armies and more military uh, purchase. They extracted from society. And the definition was created. If you produce what you consume, you don't produce. So society's economy was reduced to zero. Mm -hmm. Agricultural economies were reduced to zero. And this then led to a permanence of this figure. But a similar figure is the yield figure. Yeah. When if you measure yield as a singular commodity in a monoculture, mm -hmm. of course the monoculture will have more of the monoculture. That's tautological, mm -hmm. but it will not have more food. It will not have more nutrition. And I have spent the last 36 years measuring true productivity of systems. But not just that, I've been saving seeds. I've just come back from the Navdanya Biodiversity Farm and I'll be more than happy to send you announcements later about the courses we offer so that the young greens of your part of the world join. And this year, because of the whole lockdown, we are doing it on Zoom, but I hope they'll be able to fill it. In just one patch of two feet by two feet, I collected 30 uncultivated plants. Now, if you spray glyphosate and round and herbicides, all that goes, right? We have a report. I started to study biodiversity. We have a report mm -hmm. on nutrition per acre. Before that, I did this. I said, I'm going to measure biodiversity, not monoculture yield. Monoculture yield will have more on the monoculture. It's not a very smart thing. And my studies have shown it's the water and the land that accounts for the increase, not the chemicals or the GMOs or the seeds. Mm -hmm. So I did this. This was actual farms. And then we converted this into nutrition per acre. Mm -hmm. Nutrition per acre is much higher in biodiverse farms. And our report is showing that if India farmed this way, which is conserving biodiversity, working with Mother Earth rather than declaring war on her with war chemicals, we can feed two times India's population with good balanced nutrition rather than have 
every fourth Indian hungry today, every second child severely malnourished. This is a war system. It is not a food system. I, I really agree with you deeply about the, the issue of working with Earth rather than putting her at our service um, in, such a, in such a brutal way as, as we do currently. Um, but I get some, some pushback from some of my friends. They're like, oh, well, you know, uh, Dr. Shiva, you know, if we all went and started growing at our own farms and if we all started doing our, you know, having that kind of relationship with the Earth, well, then we wouldn't be able to feed all of society. Or the other thing they tell me is that then we would all have to be farmers and we wouldn't be able to enjoy our modernity, if, if I may say. Okay. I mean, this is so full of brainwashed repetition mm -hmm. of slogans of colonization. Okay. Number one. The industrial system is not feeding the world. I have a whole book I did when I was ambassador of the Expo in Milan, which was based on feeding the world. They asked me to write a book. And I wrote a book called Who Really Feeds the World? And it's available all over Europe. Mm -hmm. And it's available in Italian, uh, but it's available in English uh, from, I think, Z Books. And it's available from Penguin in America. Um, and I wrote this book because I was asked by the U Expo. And... I've shown in it that based on government figures, based on United Nations figures, so the United Nations FAO has told us that 80% of the food we eat comes from small farms and gardens. Really? Only 20% comes from industrial farms. Wow. What do industrial farms produce? They don't produce food, they produce commodities. Now, most of these commodities, which are now GMO, corn and soya, Look across Europe. Is the hybrid corn being used by people for food or is it going as animal feed? Is the canola going for biofuel or are you eating it? Uh, the GMO soya, 90% is biofuel and animal feed. But because this commodity market is so big, they've reduced crops to raw materials of industry. And this then means they have to invade into the Amazon to have more of the commodities. The system is so inefficient that it is making a billion people starve. Now, for those who think, ah, oh, modernity, how will we enjoy modernity without a garden? First of all, anyone who has an option is cut. And with the corona epidemic, more people are gardening because no one trusts the junk food. And the data is very clear. Junk food, industrial food is leading to chronic diseases. We have three books on that. How Industrial food is the root of chronic diseases, your diabetes, your cancers, your obesity, your endocrine disruption, your infertility, your neurological problems, add it all up, it's trillions of dollars. But when you have these problems and then you get this little virus, the risks of mortality shoot up. And you know now all the medical records are admitting most people are dying of comorbidity caused by a bad food system than because of a virus. Mm -hmm. Only 1% or 0.5% are dying because of the virus. The rest are dying because of industrial food. Now, food is supposed to be for health and nourishment. Mm -hmm. It is not supposed to kill you. Of course, for the industry that moved from Hitler's Germany into making agrochemicals, let's not forget that that same industry moved from making chemicals into making pharmaceuticals. And mm -hmm. it all were based on fossil fuels. So big mm -hmm. pharma today, is the same industry that sells the poisons that give you cancer. They have patents on the cancer medicine. So are they going to reduce cancer in society or are they going to increase cancer in society? Mm -hmm. Bayer has bought Monsanto. It is good business on the part of Bayer to spread glyphosate, which is recognized by the World Health Organization as a carcinogen. So the more they spray Roundup and glyphosate, the more people get cancer, the more drugs they sell. The sicker the society, the bigger the market for big pharma. And this is not a food system. And finally, if it is so efficient, tell your friends who think that this system is feeding the world, ask them, why are a billion people hungry? That's a very good question. And, and, then, and then there's also all the food waste, which you have to factor into it because you have all these extended uh, supply chains which aren't working. There's one thing you so, touched on. Just let me just let, okay. add to that. So I did a book called Soil Not Oil in the lead up to the Copenhagen Climate Summit because 
I was seeing that food was not coming up in the climate discussions. And then I looked at the data, and since then it's very clear. About 10 to 15% comes from the production of food with synthetic fertilizers, big machinery. Another 20% comes by cutting down forests for soybean and palm oil. Another 20% comes from heavy packaging, long distance transport, I call it food miles, mm -hmm. and processing. So you've already reached a huge amount. And then 4% is food waste because when you grow uniformity, you waste a lot of food. When you do long distance transport, you'd waste about a lot of food. That's 50% of the climate problem is coming from the system. 100% of the climate solution lies in ecological, local, biodiverse agriculture. I love what you're saying. I believe you entirely. And here's, there's one very interesting thing. Um, I, I don't know how you felt about it, but last year there was the high profile um, case in the United States where I think it was what drove Monsanto bankrupt, where they had to close and they had to be bought out by buyer. And yeah. you, were, you were getting a lot of pressure for calling them out on glyphos glyphosate, but it usually isn't until somebody pops the truth out there that people don't come to this realization. What's the situation with that? Why don't you tell me about how, about that transition, how, how important that case was and how that, that yeah. you know, how your life changed after that, but before and after. No, the, my life changed when I realized in 1987, when I was invited for a UN meeting and a meeting of independent scientists on what would the new biotechnology, what would the, you know, what would the biotechnologies do for us? Mm -hmm. And this was before GMOs were actually created. That, mm -hmm. We knew how to cut splice genes and move them. But the scientists who'd done the work put a moratorium on their work. It's called the Asilomar uh, Declaration. But then the poison cartel got hold of this and they said, wow, what a brilliant idea. We'll do genetic engineering. Then we'll claim we'd made something new. Then we will claim patents. Then we'll collect royalties and we'll make it illegal for farmers to have their own seed. I happened to be at this meeting in 87. And I said, but a seed is not a machine and a seed is not your invention. And I'm sorry if it takes all of my life to protect the integrity of the seed and the rights of the farmers to save and exchange seed. That's what I'll do. That's when I created the Navdanya movement. And your listeners can go to the website of navdanya.org to find out more. So for the first bit, they ignored me. Even though I was there in every UN convention, preventing them from undoing international treaty on biodiversity mm -hmm. and biosafety. Then Monsanto came illegally to India in 98. And I knew the laws because I've shaped international laws. I've written some of my national laws. So I called up the government. I said, did you get, give them approval? They said, no, they never came to us. So I sued them. That's when the attacks on me started. Mm -hmm. And I kept doing the research. 400,000 farmers in India have committed suicide, of which about 85% in the areas where cotton has become a Monsanto monopoly, now a biomonopoly. Mm -hmm. And this is BT Cotton, which has just been shown to be a total failure by leading scientists of the world. Yeah, I was saying this when the failure happened and the suicides happened. And then Monsanto and the public relations system unleashed on me. And the fact that you have to introduce me as a food sovereignty expert is because they've erased from my Wikipedia everything that I studied physics. Because they think somehow... By removing my physics degree from Wikipedia again and again and again, they can subdue the truth. So I am very fully aware of their tactics. So mm -hmm. we did a Monsanto trial about three years ago in The Hague. Mm -hmm. And I realized that different people were going through different things. Some are going through cancer, some are going through kidney failure, some are going through birth defects. And I said, let's bring them all together and let them give evidence. And this tribunal then triggered all these cases in the United States, where okay. cancer victims said, ah, this is because of glyphosate. This is because of Roundup. I used to spray Roundup on my farm. I used to spray Roundup in the lawns. And when the cases started, the first being Johnson, and the jury ruled against Monsanto, Monsanto then, the name was so bad that they sold off and they were having, they, they thought that by spinning off, that they'd be able to reclaim the profits. But then Bayer inherited. Bayer tried to undo the settlement. Mm -hmm. They failed. The jury scolded them. 
They're still trying to scuttle, but about four cases have been ruled against buyer, and there are about 85,000 cases in queue. 85,000 cancer cases in America. Bringing, and, coming to court. Yeah, and those Americans, they're litigious people. They love going to court and getting big. Exactly. Stuff. I really always good. say, <laughs> in these fascist times, in these fascist times, it's that litigation fever that yeah. might just create openings for people, you know? I mean, whether I mean, it's the, cancer or it's other restrictions of human, of civil liberties, you know? I mean, the company had to be bought off. Uh, uh, Dr. Shiva, let me ask you something. Um, we, are, we are running dangerously close to the end. I mean, do you, do you still have a little yeah. bit of time to chat with us or? Uh, no, I. what's the time? I can spend about seven minutes more with you. Seven minutes more. Okay. Uh, it's a, it's a pity I have a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, questions, but I want to really look at Lithuania. So oh, Okay, we'll take it to 10 minutes. All right, cool. So uh, we, we, we know that, that um, GM, well, GMO, we'll leave it for some other day because they're very complicated, but, but we're talking about, um, let's talk about fertilizers, right? And fertilizers. Fertilizers can, because we have an issue here in, in Lithuania where the head of the, the supposedly Green Peasant Party or Peasant Green Party is a, is a fertilizer magnet. And, and I'm thinking a guy who works in the fertilizer industry, doesn't that create a bit of like conflict of interest or at least cognitive dissonance when you're talking about real green policies and talking about the agricultural, agricultural practices, which are not only healthy for the earth, but also going to help us with global warming yeah. and all these other problems we have? So first, as I reminded you, the chemicals that I use in agriculture really began in Hitler's Germany. Mm -hmm. The second is the GMOs were an invention uh, as, a, as a seed, as a crop, mm -hmm. by the same poison cartel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, of course, they said the same things as they said for industrial agriculture. This will feed the world. It will be miracle increases yields. Only two crops. Herbicide tolerant that can tolerate more glyphosate and Bt toxin. Both mm -hmm. have absolutely failed, which is why they're trying to push through a Brexit deal, a new GMO, which Bill Gates is pushing, called gene editing. Mm -hmm. And new research has shown gene editing also has risks. They mm -hmm. created a calf which wouldn't have horns, but the poor calf had all kinds of bacterial infections because, you know, the genome of a living organism is a highly sophisticated self-organized system. You change one part, you change the whole. And that's what they don't get because from Hitler's Germany, came the eugenics idea, came the idea of determinism, of genetic determinism. Mm -hmm. And all of the idea of genetic engineering is based on that very flawed ground that life is like a Lego set and you can just fix yeah. things mechanically and nothing will happen. Well, our work now for 30 years around the world has shown things happen. You know, life is intelligent. Otherwise, why would the weeds become resistant to glyphosate? We have super mm -hmm. weeds in America, half the farms. In India, the bollworm has become resistant to the Bt toxin. So coming back to the second ingredient of Hitler's Germany, it's the synthetic fertilizers. First is it require, it's based on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that we don't know how to fix carbon, but fix nitrogen. And our pulses and legumes and beans have a miraculous system of fixing atmospheric nitrogen and putting it in the soil. They're nitrogen fixing crops. Mm -hmm. But the nitrogen fixing with violence in the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels was again a Nazi exercise, BASF, yeah? mm -hmm. the Haber-Bosch process. Mm -hmm. What is it doing today? A, it is contributing to greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide is 300 times more damaging to the climate than carbon dioxide, and it's growing at a faster rate. Second, it is running off into the waters, mm -hmm. killing fish life, kill, creating dead zones in the atmosphere. Third, and then when I teach Indian farmers, I take an earthworm, which is very important for organic soil, mm -hmm. and I sprinkle a little bit of synthetic fertilizer, a tiny bit. You know, if you get a leech, you put salt to get it out of your, yeah. when you're walking in a forest, you get a leech. You put salt to get rid of it. 
These are salts. You put a little bit of urea, the earthworm dies. The mycorrhizal fungi die. All the beneficial soil organisms that make soil fertile die. So it's desertifying the soil, killing the oceans, and destroying the climate. Mm -hmm. I do not think anyone engaged in synthetic fertilizer production should be called green because it's violating every principle of protection of the earth. That's beautiful. Dr. Shiva, let me ask you a question. I mean, you are you are a fighter. You're, you also seem to be an eternal uh, optimist when it comes to the way you fight. You, you always have that smile in your eye, that twinkle in your demeanor. Uh, it, it's very infectious, to be honest. Um, so let me, let me ask you, two questions because we don't have that much time. I'll put them, I'll, I'll wrap them up in one. So the first question is, how do you, how do you keep yourself going fighting against such giants, such, such tremendous industries? Uh, how, how do you keep it up? And, and what advice would you give to young people who are, who are also, you know, they, they feel that they need to step up their game in being warriors for mother earth and for, uh, and for more humane agricultural pro uh, practices, what would you tell them? So first, you know, my, my objective is not to take on a Monsanto and a Bayer and now a Bill Gates, who is the new Monsanto and Bayer. I even call him the new Columbus. My dedication is to protect the earth. And if they're coming in the way, then of course it's my duty to not let them destroy the earth. But I realized that you can't just say a no to the negative. Your strength is from the ground of creating the alternative. So when I wanted to fight Monsanto and patents of seed, I created community seed banks all over India, 150 of them, and created, reclaim the seed commons, reclaim biodiversity, wrote Indian laws so that seed is not patentable. When it came to chemical fertilizers and synthetic pesticides, I started to grow the organic movement. And we have the largest network of organic farmers and producers in the country who create their own sovereignty. And once you've done the right thing, then the seed teaches you, the soil teaches you, the pollinator teaches you, the earthworm teaches you, and they don't just teach you. You just do a tiny piece of the work they do the rest. So for the young people who want to find the best way, I'm offering a course from the 5th of October to the 11th of October on Zoom mm -hmm. on return to the earth. How you can protect the earth, create your future. How the rights of Mother Earth and your rights as a future generation are one right. Because you depend on air and water and food and health. The earth gives all this if we protect her. Our main work is protect the earth, love the earth. That is green politics. And for those who say, how, how come you don't get tired? Love does not exhaust you. Love regenerates you. Otherwise, ask all the mothers who brought us up. Why did not you not get tired bringing us up? When they made us adults, you know, love regenerates. Hate depletes. Chemical fertilizers deplete. Organic manure replenishes. That's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, doctor, thank you very much for your time. Actually, the friend who put us in contact, Evelda Jalukas, he, he really wanted me to prime you um, in telling us something about bees. Because Lithuanians, I think you don't know, but we Lithuanians, uh, we have very old pagan traditions and 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 the bees are an integral part of even a, you know of our beliefs i think you know when you, you when you refer to a good friend of yours you say a bichulis a bichulis is like my bee my bee buddy my bee friend wow and, yeah and he asked me he asked me to just just really quickly see if i if you can get the uh, vananda to tell you anything about bees because she has one okay yeah so just two things one i am an ambassador for Save the Bees initiative for Europe. Mm -hmm. And I would request all of your listeners to look for this Save the Bees and become signatories so that if you have a referendum, if, if you have enough signatories, you'll have a referendum to ban the pesticides that are killing the bees. So that hate of Hitler's Germany 
which was against other human beings, then created a marketing of making it look like every insect was going to get us. But bees are insects. And therefore, the pesticides have led to this threat to the existence of bees. And just like your culture celebrates the bee as sacred, mm -hmm. in my culture, I have known so many indigenous tribes who have the bee as the goddess. And there's a lovely story, you know, in my culture, you always have the ego gods, the male gods, who bless the demons with all the powers of the world. And then it was the divine goddesses who would appear and say, you've given the wrong boon to the wrong person and I'll have to do something. So again, an e egomaniac God gave an egomaniac demon all the parts. And this demon started to destroy everything. And the divine goddess became the bee, Brahmahari. And by stinging the demon, she defeated him and his armies by the sting of the bee. <laughs> That's beautiful. It's so lovely. Oh, and one more lesson for... All of us, for a green mm -hmm. philosophy, our ancient Vedic taste says, you want to run an economy, never extract, never exploit. Learn from the bee. The bee goes to the flower, pollinates the flower and gives the next generation of seed through fertilizing and takes the pollen and turns the nectar into honey. Both are enriched. This is the mutuality. This is the economy of giving. This is the new economy we must all create around the world. The old ideas are over. There's only one idea, an economy of life, an economy of the sacred, around a sacred nature. That's beautiful. Those are such beautiful thoughts. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Welcome. Shiva. I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful. Um, I did not know that the Nazis were also responsible for so much uh, agriculture. Uh, what would you call that? Apocalypse as well? Yeah. Eugenics, yeah. genetic engineering, and the bad agriculture. We just have to go back to the Nazi roots and everything will become clear. You know? That today freedom is for the earth, for people, no superiority, no hierarchies, and no extermination. Not of the bee, not of human beings. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.